It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. It's Dr. Adrian Fairhall, professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at the University of Washington. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say she was also a former Allen Distinguished Investigator and a founding member of the uh, Allen Institute for Brain Science MindScope uh, Advisory Council. Thanks, Dr. Kathy. Uh, so I thought I would take the opportunity to talk uh, about a recent experience I had as part of the, uh, the working group for the, the new uh, Brain 2.0, because part of our uh, mission in that committee was to sort of review the state of theory um, in neuroscience, and as that has been funded by the first round of Brain, and see uh, where it's going. So really, uh, what's the role of theory uh, in the Brain Initiative? So I just wanted to throw this up uh, to start, which is, you know, as um, I think theoretical neuroscientists, we like to think that we are very modern in uh, putting mathematical methods into neuroscience. I wondered how many people were able to identify this quote. So let's assume as the basis for all our subsequent reasoning, when two, element, two elementary brain processes have been active together or in immediate succession, one of them on reoccurring tends to propagate its excitement into the other. Who? Hebb. Yeah, we all think Hebb, right? 1950s. But, in fact, this is William James, 1890, right? This is 100 years uh, ago. People were already starting to build what I would call theories of how the brain works and to, to speculate on how those elementary processes work together to cause function. You know, this, some of you probably also recognize, you know, it's a beautiful diagram of a neural network, something we feel very comfortable with. So whose is this? Turing, Turing, right, so back in, the, back in the 40s. So people have been putting theory into neuroscience uh, for a very long time. When we use the word theory in neuroscience, people mean very different things. And I would like to kind of lay out the landscape of the things that people mean as sort of dividing into big T theories, sort of top down, how does the thing work? Modeling, we've heard a fit, fair bit about, about that sort of approach already and data analysis. And these three things are somewhat distinct and hopefully all work together. And the way I would like to frame that they work together is in coming up with a full understanding of the brain, really what we're trying to do is put all of those together to build an understanding that involves both an identification of the computation that the system is trying to do its implementation in terms of some kind of high dimensional model or even just of the experimental data, and some understanding of how does this high dimensional data or model point us to a low dimensional model that allows us to extract the fundamental mechanism. And it's through these interactions between these different approaches that I think we see all the, um, all the people that need to contribute to this field. So we've heard already from two physicists, so I would put physicists along here, right? They are, we're trying to build high dimensional systems of differential equations. Good physicists will try to reduce that to some kind of lower dimensional model. We heard about that from Peter really beautifully, a, a neural field model that forms a low dimensional model from this high dimensional uh, system. That gives us a lot of information about parameter invariance, robustness, right? How we can cost grain the system. Ultimately, what we need to do is to extract meaning from these high dimensional and low dimensional models to tell us about the computation. As physicists, we're a little uncomfortable with that. You know, we, uh, we like to build systems of differential equations. We don't really like to tell uh, them to do things, right? In order to build something that carries out a function, we turn to our friends, the computer scientists, because they are engineers who know how to build stuff that does things. And so to get to this computational level, that's where I feel like the field has really benefited from interactions with engineers and computer scientists. All right, so uh, let's review a few of the big T theories uh, that, that neuroscience has ever come up with. So Hebbian learning, we've seen a little bit from that from, uh, from James. Hierarchical sensory representation, extremely influential idea uh, from uh, uh, Maher and Pojo. Motion detection has a theoretical basis. Attractors as memory. Attractors for neural integration, balanced excitation and inhibition, efficient coding, predictive coding, uh, theories of decision making, theories about binding through correlation, reinforcement learning, and the idea that the brain is Bayesian. So you know, I've been trying to come up with, with more if you have any uh, other suggestions, but to me that's a fairly um, definitive list of, 
all of the ideas that have been floated in a sort of top-down fashion by theorists that have really guided the kinds of experiments that, that people have done and the way that we go about posing experiments and posing our data analysis. So let's, uh, let's turn to Brain 2025. This is a very a beautiful document uh, that was really the foundation for the way that funding was distributed uh, through the Brain Initiative. So it was uh, set up to have these different categories, discovering uh, diversity, maps at multiple scales, brain in action, demonstrating causality, identifying fundamental principles, human neuroscience, and from brain to brain. And in reality, what that meant was studying cell type, stu uh, trying to extract circuit diagrams, monitoring neural activity, interventional tools, theory and data analysis tools, human neuroscience, and integrated approaches. And what I hope that you'll see from this figure is that identifying fundamental principles is what the Brain Initiative expected from theory and data analysis. Theory and data analysis is really uh, the core of, of the Brain Initiative. So I would say where um, developing tools were kind of the, um, what people thought identify really with the Brain Initiative, uh, the heart of it is really, really theory. Because without theory, all of the data that we collect with these cool new tools is kind of uh, useless to us. I love this uh, diagram from Eli Schlitzerman where he more, uh, I think, put the brain initiative in a way that um, even the brain initiative doesn't know how to do. So, you know, it was all about generating maps, uh, looking at the brain in action on the substructure of those maps, and from that, uh, extracting fundamental principles. So the scientific, what do we mean by extract, identifying fundamental principles? The scientific goal, as uh, posed by Brain 2025, was to produce conceptual foundations for understanding the biological basis of mental processes through the, the development of new theoretical and data analysis tools. So there is a long set of things, there's a long wish list that theorists and uh, data analysts were posed by Brain 2025. And let's just quickly go through what, there was too much to read, let's just summarize them. They, we needed uh, data analysis tools for non-stationary processes, theory to tell us what detail is needed in experimental observations, quick ways of looking at data, how to scale up known data analysis methods for larger neural populations, how to do things in real time so we could build uh, closed loop systems. Doesn't stop. Where do brain rhythms come from? Functional connectivity measures. How do we infer functional connectivity from data? How do we combine information across sources and scales? How do we solve the inverse problem for whole brain data? Cross-scale modeling, including dynamic markers of internal state. There's more, we're not over. Bridging from components to function. This is where I started to get really oppressed, actually, when I was trying to write the review of what the field had done, because basically this is all of neuroscience. How do neural codes or dynamics come together to support behavior? Plasticity mechanisms and learning, theories of motor action, information routing through the brain, internal brain states, decision-making, goal-directed behavior. All of neuroscience is all built into the small part of Brain 2025 for which the theorists are responsible. So how have we done? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th I, mean, I think we've already seen uh, from all the talks so far that the big challenge for theory is the fact that we have to bridge multiple levels, right? We understand more and more about how individual computing elements, you know, what they mean in terms of uh, their roles in, in circuits. From that, we would like to be able to understand emergent network dynamics. And really, I think the hard part is uh, extracting algorithms from that underlying uh, dynamics. Successes of, of what's been done in the last few years. These were the three major categories, data analysis, multi-scale methods, and fundamental principles. I think data analysis has been uh, a roaring success in the last few years of BRAIN. So we've seen enormous advances in how to understand EM data, and the Allen Institute are definitely taking advantage of that uh, through um, machine learning tools, through Google, through Sebastian Sung's lab. Really beautiful advances also in, uh, in understanding calcium imaging data. Lovely new tools to do uh, spike sorting for very large um, measurements from data from NeuroPixels and other, other tools. And also very innovative and beautiful uh, new machine learning tools to analyze behavior. So across all the scales, we now have, I think, uh, people are making use of the AI uh, uh, advances of the last few years and turning them to neuroscience in extremely productive ways. So we're doing very well in pre-processing data. How about in using data analysis to build models? So here, back in the olden days, we would uh, you know, characterize a neuron, say, through its receptive field. 
in the, over the last decade, uh, people have been interested, rather than in characterizing how single neurons represent information, in thinking instead about how the population represents information. So here's a classic picture from, say, um, motor cortex, where now we're plotting uh, firing rates of, of several neurons at once uh, in a dimension, using a dimensionality reduction technique such that you can see the trajectories uh, that firing rates of a whole population uh, carry out in time during three different motions. And of course here, uh, this happens to be three different motions that the, that the animal did. We still don't have, I think, very effective tools for co-clustering uh, movement, complicated movements with um, neural activity spaces. And so, so where, where have we gone with, with that in being able to look at both high dimensional behavior or high dimensional stimuli and high dimensional uh, representations in the brain? There has been progress, and again, using uh, the AI rev revolution, uh, this is recent work from David Cicillo, Larry Abbott, and others, uh, where they use um, uh, recurrent neural networks to, to model what's going on uh, by projecting activity into low dimensional, low-ish dimensional dynamical systems. And so I, you are really not going to talk through that. Uh, it's, it's actually very complicated and rather hard to uh, interpret. But we can now fit data uh, infinitely better. And I think these tools will eventually point us toward the kinds of low dimensional models that we would like to uh, be able to extract from data. Uh, Multi-scale methods, I won't talk more about that because we had really two beautiful talks uh, about those kinds of approaches already. And we're going to hear, I think, another one from Anton. You know, how does one go between single neuron uh, properties and network level properties, thinking of the brain as a, as a physical system? Some, uh, some good progress there. In terms of fundamental principles, I think the, the main uh, advances of the past few years are really um, those that are regarding neural activity in parallel with advances in engineered uh, neural networks. So everyone knows that a uh, you know, huge revolution is that of deep neural networks, and that is certainly forming a very powerful sort of model for how uh, brains might work. Uh, perhaps even more powerful are uh, advances in how to think about recurrent neural networks. So rather than building a network as a feed-forward system, one can connect it up recurrently, as, as in our brain. And what that does is to give to the network the power of memory. It then has multiple time scales. Uh, memory can be stored within the network and re can reverberate. So Hopfield showed many years ago that networks of this type, here I'm just you know, plotting for you the, the connectivity matrix of a recurrent network. Such networks have uh, the property that they have attractor-like solutions so that firing rates can settle into, uh, say, discrete modes that may represent information. And these uh, attractors have cool properties like pattern completion. If you start the, the system somewhere near one of those attractors, it will uh, move toward one. And that may be the basis for memory, for example, as a beautiful idea of Hopfield uh, many years ago. There are many other solutions that can be embedded within attractor networks, line attractors, limit cycles, chaotic networks. And all of these have given us a kind of library of ideas about the way complex networks may, uh, may generate sort of low dimensional dynamics. So uh, some of those predictions or some of those ideas have, have been uh, shown to, to be reasonable. So the idea of a ring attractor, for example, there's an idea that Heimson Polinsky posed um, as a possible way that cortex might generate um, orientation selectivity. Uh, it's been shown recently that the dynamics of representation of head direction in, uh, in Drosophila seems to rep look very much like uh, the dynamics predicted by, by a ring attractor. Uh, the idea that um, dynamics come from highly recurrent neural networks uh, gives us other ways of thinking about data beyond simply attractor solutions. So people have used the, the concept of reservoir networks, where you just take uh, a bunch of neurons, you connect them together. That system generates high dimensional chaotic dynamics from which one could learn to extract particular patterns. And so one idea is that the brain may serve as kind of reservoir of complex uh, features, complex temporal, spatial temporal features, from which the learning problem may just correspond to the ability to extract specific modes of those dynamics. And so one can fit, um, one can fit that to data. You can train a network to extract specific, say, periodic patterns or even very complicated patterns. 
and Larry Abbott in collaboration with Krishna Shanoi and Mark Churchland have shown that models like this do very well in accounting for uh, the dynamics in motor cortex, for example. Uh, this has spurred, I'd say in the last few years, a field of what uh, Wyeth Baer very cleverly termed artophysiology, looking at uh, artificial neural networks and trying to characterize them as though that network were an experimental system. And then, you know, one of the first examples of that is looking at uh, the receptive fields, for example, of different layers of a, of a feed-forward deep neural network. And what people uh, pointed out is that the features that drive, uh, that optimally drive neurons that are quite deep into a deep network have some at least superficial similarity to the kinds of receptive fields that have been characterized for V4. And this uh, work along these lines is uh, being done here by, by Michael and Stefan and others. Mother, other examples of what we call autophysiologies, this is one of the, the earlier papers by uh, Valeria Monte and um, and Bill Newsom and others, one can train your neural network to do a specific task and then use that neural network as a way to suggest what is the computational structure of the activity that you would expect to carry out that task. So here, they trained a neural network you know, to solve a, I'm not gonna go through it, a, a fairly complicated um, choice task where they could change the, the specific feature of the stimulus that corresponded to that choice. They were able to extract uh, the structure of that computation, which was that there appeared two different attractors and a line attractor that separated them. And they were able to then go back to their data and look for that kind of structure in that data. Here's a more recent example from uh, um, Josieri lab from uh, last year, where in this case, uh, a monkey was trained to produce a behavior with a certain uh, temporal structure and they could change the, the temporal structure. So they had to produce, say, uh, an arm movement in a certain amount of time, and they could change the certain amount of time. And then what they saw was that the neural firing patterns looked like they simply stretched out in time. And so they correspondingly trained a neural network to do the same task. Again, we're able to sort of analyze what was the internal structure of the network that carried that out, and that gave them ways to better understand what they were seeing in their data. All right, so that has been uh, very helpful, and it's, it will be interesting to see where that goes in the future of thinking about recurrent artificial neural networks as a kind of model system in which we have access to everything in that system, and we can kind of break apart the kinds of computations that are necessary to carry out a task. So what are the new opportunities that, that, uh, that we see over the next five years uh, that are being opened by new technologies, being opened by new uh, data? So as we've all seen in uh, recent months, there's spectacular new experimental methods uh, that allow us to do kind of 3D, three-dimensional read-write, right? So uh, holographic microscopy allows you to, in th you know, to monitor sets of neurons that are doing particular things and use optogenetics to change the activity patterns of, in very uh, well, uh, precise ways in, uh, over for specific neurons. And so that's just the beginning, I think, of a, of a huge opportunity to be able to uh, close the loop and do real-time perturbations of, of neural systems. Great opportunity for theorists to pose uh, questions that can really be looked at in, in great detail uh, in, uh, in neural networks. Other possibilities that are, um, that are raised by the kinds of detailed connectivity maps that the Allen Institute has been very involved in building uh, now we have you know, quite a lot of knowledge about connectivity. Can we turn that into predictions about the kind of dynamical modes uh, that systems are able to generate? Uh, here's a, a, a very nice example of doing that from Eli Schlitzerman at, at UW, where uh, he's used the connectivity diagram of C. elegans and turned that into uh, proposals for the kinds of dynamical modes that such uh, a network would be able to generate and then uh, hook that up to a behavioral model, uh, an, a muscle model of the animal, and can drive uh, a C. elegans uh, model to move backward or forward according to uh, the modes that the model generates. Uh, networks with cell types, another example of where the Allen has contributed uh, really profoundly to uh, a huge amount of new data that, that theorists have to take seriously. Single neuron properties uh, influence um, how individual neurons process information, and we need to take that into account. Uh, neurons with different cell types presumably have different roles in microcircuits. They can implement dynamics with multiple time scales that depends on the, the ion channel um, composition. They may have different intrinsic plasticity mechanisms and they're also modulatable. 
So we are now able increasingly to monitor um, neurotransmitter um, concentrations in vivo. We know that neurotransmitters uh, can dramatically alter neuron and synapse properties, and they also play a vital role in high-level uh, theories such as reinforcement learning. And so the opportunity is here to really put flesh on the bones of our somewhat abstract models of, say, reinforcement learning that rely on dopamine to tell you about error. Uh, now it's time for, that, um, for those models to really match uh, data because we will have the data to, to, um, to test those against. The question is, are we still missing kind of big pieces of the puzzle? Uh, I think we really don't understand uh, plasticity mechanisms at the level that we should. Presumably, there are many uh, that we're not incorporating. Most neural network models, just as a very simple example, don't uh, incorporate neuronal plasticity. The fact that single neuron dynamics can cause changes in the response properties of neurons over many seconds, that we don't even need to change synaptic plasticity in order to get network level plasticity through intrinsic mechanisms. Chemical communication, no models at the moment put that in. Right, so we have uh, neurotransmitters that, well, okay, maybe some do. <laughs> I will never say no models. Obviously, people are, are working with uh, neuro, neuropeptides and neurotransmitters, but that's likely to be a very important piece of the puzzle for network models uh, going forward that can implement things like dynamic switching of, of network uh, behaviors. We are not very far along, and physics is not very far along in uh, coming up with, with good theories of emergent properties of networks. That, that is, um, neural networks are the most complicated physical system, I think, that we, that we work with. And we're, um, we're sort of floundering a little bit to do the kinds of rigorous theory on that that we would like to be able to do. Control theory is an aspect of, of uh, physics and engineering that, that has only had um, you know, some inroads into neuroscience, and obviously now we have the ability to do read-write. That is going to, I think, be a very important part of uh, theoretical approaches going forward. GLIA, everyone's probably seen, you know, all the recent papers about GLIA. We, those we really don't put into network <laughs> models. And clearly, uh, I think the, the data is showing more and more that GLIA are playing a very important role in modifying plasticity and conveying information that, that we haven't taken into account. And I'm sure everyone has their other guesses for the things that we don't know that we don't know that we should be, should be putting in. All right, so the next five years, I think it's fair to say at the moment we have no definitive complete theory of any brain function. So the field would, the, the world, uh, the brain initiative would like us to, to do that. I think we need to maintain a diversity of theoretical approaches. We need to both think about high-level theories. We need to continue with low-level theories. We need methods that bridge these kinds of, uh, of different approaches. Uh, the people would like us to come up with a theory of cell types. You know, with our, uh, the Allen has been beautifully demonstrating that the more you look, right, the more, more cell types you have. There are hundreds of different kinds of cell types. Is there some kind of theoretical um, principle by which we would be able to say, okay, you're done, that is a cell type, and that's, that's sufficient. People would like a theory of uh, sufficiency in recording. Do we really have to record from every neuron? Can we get away with recording one in 10, one in 20? Under what theoretical principle can we make that, that statement? Finally, I think theorists really uh, need to be more ambitious, and um, I speak for myself too, that um, you know, we're, there's a lot on our shoulders, right, that we should be uh, really uh, contributing deeply to solving all of these major problems. And perhaps there aren't enough of us, you know, it's, it's 10 people trying to conquer Australia. I think there's a lot of need for, for more people. We're losing, we're bleeding great people into uh, industry who are going off to, to Google and using these great, great methods to, you know, to mine your email. We would love them to mine, <laughs> you know, how does the brain work? So we need more people, we need to keep those people, we need to keep training and recruiting and I uh, need to think about how we can improve how we do things in order to, to progress faster. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? We may have time for a question, if there are any. Of course, Christoph. There was a beautiful, robust defense of, um, of, uh, of theory. So 
Where do you think we are, A, for example, in, or is this even, um, does it even make conceptual sense to have a theory of something like C elegance? And B, uh, I would say any mature theory or sign of the maturity of a theory is if it predicts, um, you know, new classes of phenomena, black holes, gravitational lensing, various quantum mechanical superposition that weren't appreciated at all when the people themselves came up with a theory. Right. When are we going to be in such a case in uh, neuroscience? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And you know, in fact, although it was a robust uh, um, call for theory, I, I think that the lessons from neural network modeling sometimes do make one very anxious that there won't be one, there won't be a good theory, right? That it'll, it'll boil down to fitting very complicated models, million parameter models, and somehow that system worked. I mean, I haven't given up, I, I, I believe that and in fact, I think some of these examples show us that that's true, you have a million parameter model, you train it, but you can extract meaning from it by looking at the attractor structure that's, that's underlying it, that explains to you why when you do uh, neural um, data analysis, things tend to become much more low dimensional than you might expect, right? They don't have to be low dimensional, but very often data analysis shows that things become low dimensional. and so. I'm hoping that those kinds of approaches uh, will maybe generate a new kind of theory by which uh, that may not be sort of the bottom up um, physics approach of sort of renormalization group. You know, we have this, we, we slightly coarse grain it, we get a different model, and we now understand that model. It might be um, a more kind of data driven uh, approach. When will that turn into something that generates predictions? I think if you were able to um, build that model, find the low dimensional dynamics and use that as a proxy for what's going on in the brain, you could then explore it and see how it, um, what kinds of new activity patterns it generates with different kinds of drive, if that were a good model. Of course, the worry is that with so many properties that you're not measuring, neurotransmitters that may uh, change with mood, the entire structure that you've characterized so beautifully might be different under different situations, and so your model won't then apply, and I, that is always um, an anxiety. So can right. you give me a number, a year for, for all of what ten, you said? 10 years. No, no, for <laughs> C elegance. C elegance, as you know, is 3 to 2 neurons. Right? Yeah. We're not talking about 10 to the 8 neurons here. It's less than 10 to the 3 neurons. Right. Well, I, you know, the slide I showed from Ellie's work actually gave me some hope, right? So Ellie takes the, the connectome, puts in some knowledge about the characterized biophysical properties, and generates modes that do, could actually function to drive the kinds of behavior that we see in C. elegans. So I, I find that hopeful, right? That there really are examples, at least in very small systems, where that you know, ground up approach may work. And that's sort of the motivation that I have for working with Hydra is that that might be a case where we really can take the neural activity that we observe, run it through a model where we understand the way that, you know, that muscles communicate with one another, that the biophysics of the, of the, the body, uh, we, and the biomechanics of the body is sort of characterized, we may really be able to predict the behavior and from that to infer why the neural system has to drive activity the way it does in order to generate behavior. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm more hopeful about small systems. Big systems, uh, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.